Hello everyone and welcome to BIMSTORM Oklahoma City. This is webinar number one, October 15th. We'll be starting in a minute here. Over the next few weeks we will be having a webinar on Monday each day at the same time heading into the live session on November 7th and there will also be a live presentation in Oklahoma City on November 12th. So welcome again. This is BIMSTORM Oklahoma City. Very excited to be here. Tammy, are you online by any chance? I'd like to introduce you or if you'd like to say a word or I'll just keep on rolling through. Tammy and Lee are professors at the College of Architecture, University of Oklahoma who are the sponsors of this uh, dream course for BIMSTORM Oklahoma City involving their students in Oklahoma and also inviting the world to participate uh, through this BIMSTORM. Um, a unique new type of BIMSTORM where we have um, the College of Architecture involved in the planning and, and um, work on the BIMSTORM. So my name is Kimono Numa from Onuma Inc. We started the BIM storm several years ago and have had over 30 BIM storms so far with several thousand participants worldwide. Very excited to start up the BIM storm Oklahoma City. Online with us, we have Fineth Jernigan, author of Big BIM, Little BIM, and Makers of the Environment, a new book. Fineth, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, welcome, everybody, and uh, we'll hope you have, um, hope you got your. Uh, the time set aside and uh, your uh, interest built up because uh, Oklahoma City BIM storm should be a really good thing. Thanks, Fina. So just some some background. Um, I presented this over the last few weeks at a, several conferences, and I the the, the starting point is uh, years ago, um, three hundred thousand years ago. Actually, we we're sitting around campfires, communicating with each other, using technologies like fire to advanced civilization and we were commuting communicating by word of mouth and as technology advanced and we fast forward hundreds of thousands of years all of a sudden we had a new technology a civilization moved forward and we were able to capture our thoughts and ideas and share them uh, with next generations this is a huge step forward as an architect uh, i've watched um, the building industry documenting our ideas in um, documents like this which essentially have not changed for a very long time it's basically lines and text on uh, a flat sheet of paper uh, and even now with building information modeling it's still very much kind of geared towards producing the set of documents our focus in BIMSTORM is to go beyond the documentation and think about information and as an architect I, I really feel very strongly that uh, we need to move the industry forward I feel that uh, architecture and specifically has uh, fallen a little bit behind or actually quite a bit behind of the technology curve and now is really the time to change and that's why we do these BIM storms we actually want to break the information silos and move the building industry forward we are open to sharing our ideas and the way that we do things on uh, real world projects but we open up BIM storms uh, to be kind of a collaborative open event for anybody to jump in and, and learn and and uh, even fail. We, we want to fail fast and, and learn from that and move forward. And that's what's been really happening. It's, it's all about disruptive technologies. It sounds negative, but actually disruptive technologies have changed a lot of different, a lot of things. For example, the internet has pretty much disrupted everything that we know about running a business in the last uh, 10 years or, or more. And now with smartphones and tablets, we're essentially carrying around computers that we would, would not have even imagined we would have had access to even four or five years ago and the ability to locate information on a map and and collaborate with others from wherever you are has completely changed things for example I'm sitting uh, uh, 3,000 miles away from my office yet I'm still able to to work with my team here and work with everybody in the BIM storm to the location really doesn't matter so revolutions have happened uh, communication everybody thought Facebook was kind of a uh, a toy when it first came out but that's really about connecting people to, people to each other and that essentially hasn't changed over the 300,000 year span of when we were sitting around the campfire it's still about connecting people and even with the new technologies it's not only about the technology it's about connecting people and making decisions capturing knowledge 
and moving the building industry forward too with BIM storms. We feel that uh, a lot of the work that's being done in the building industry is still is pretty much stuck in the 18th or 19th century as far as process goes. And a lot of the younger generation, when they get out of school, they head to uh, work in the, in the building industry. They, they, are, they would be shocked and many things that seem very antiquated. So BIM storm is meant to uh, be disruptive to change the industry, to create revolutions, and to connect people. And this is actually Penn State and the BIMSTORM Los Angeles, where we had um, over 130 teams from around the world working for 24 hours. BIMSTORMs are charrettes, workshops um, on steroids. Uh, they connect people from wherever you are. Um, it's really about making decisions about design and planning, city planning, designing a building. You notice each student has a different view of information on, on their laptop there. And uh, by extension today, now we have tablets and smartphones and being able to access information and collaborate to make decisions has radically changed how things work. We use a lot of different tools in the BIMSTORM. Um, the Onuma system is one of the tools that we use and it's a web-based building information modeling tool that connects BIM geographic information systems, GIS, or being able to locate something with latitude and longitude, and then being able to drill down to individual buildings and rooms and equipment. And as you're making changes, just like in Facebook, others can see it in real time. So when you're working on the internet, you come to expect to be able to access real-time information of where are my friends or where can I find the nearest Starbucks. And the technology has to do that has been around for many years, but now by doing uh, Using this approach, we're bringing that type of a capability to the building industry. It's being used on actual projects, uh, so a lot of a lot of the same efforts that went into developing BIM storms are used for the California Community Colleges, for example. This is a mashup of GIS coming from ArcGIS server and QGIS and Google Earth and BIM coming from the Onuma BIM server to be able to even see utility lines along with BIM and the color coding and everything's dynamically driven by a database. So as data changes, you're seeing things online that uh, update. It was very exciting a few weeks ago to see the Oklahoma City GIS uh, coming from Oklahoma City. Uh, uh, the, the, um, we were kind enough to share the GIS data. So we have some pretty nice information as far as streets and parcels and existing buildings now uh, streaming in live from a server into the Onuma system in this view here, and we'll be looking at this live in a few minutes here. But it's basically the black buildings are existing. The blue buildings along the bottom are uh, Tammy and Lee's students. Uh, they've started to put in uh, different uh, massing studies uh, uh, along the, uh, uh, the river front area there. Um, and Oklahoma City, um, maybe Fineth, would you like to say a few words about um, the background of this uh, planning exercise from Oklahoma City? Well, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I'm the absolute best person to, um, to describe this since I don't live there either. But, um, you know, basically uh, the BIM storm's going to work. We're going to be working with the core to shore area, which if um, maybe, Kamon, could you, um, you know, sort of po point to that, you know, the area down near the, uh, near the river? Or you, can you... Um, Kind of focus everybody. I think anybody who um, who set in on the planning director's um, uh, presentation probably got a pretty good overview of this with uh, Hubcap Alley, uh, which is the yellow um, section. Uh, can you show that uh, come on right right above the? You, so you've got the River's Edge area, which has not been. There's really not a whole lot of plans for, from what we can tell. You've got Hubcap Alley. And you've got the river neighborhoods, uh, the relocated interstates above it, uh, connecting to the to downtown, you know, the more densely po dense part of the downtown. And you know, it's pretty much the, the one of the nice things about BIM storms is the it's a pretty much open uh, open blank sheet of paper to work within this area. We we hope that people will use you know good you know, good planning, good urban design kind of thinking to come up with, with creative solutions, but it really is an open slate or open clean slate that you can come in and uh, really express yourself, show what you can do, you know, really practice. And I think as Kamon said earlier, the whole idea with this is it's a very low risk, 
way to try things. And if if you if something doesn't work, you know, just dump it and go on to the next thing. It's a very you know, the, I think the expression on the web is fail fast and move on. And this is a fail fast and move on situation. You know, exactly. Try something and move on. Exactly. Yeah. We. Um... What's exciting about this, actually, in previous BIM storms, we had to actually go out and seek um, planning scenarios. Uh, some were based on real-world scenarios. Uh, others we had to completely make up from what we knew what was happening in the city. For example, in BIM storm Los Angeles, we did not even interact with the planning department. We just started looking at what was going on with different planning exercises and inserted them into the BIM storm. In Oklahoma City, uh, it's a very interesting project, actually, because the old... Um, freeway that's running east-west across cutting through the downtown area there is being demolished uh, a lot of cities other cities in the US also have this kind of uh, approach going on that uh, uh, the decisions that might have been made in the past are no longer relevant and now they're looking at moving that further south and expanding and then also um, uh, capturing the, 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 the water in the river to create a, a it's a dry river most of the year, but they've dammed part of it and are able to create a riverfront area now with a world-class rowing facility that is even used by the Olympic team. So the whole area where you see kind of the white area right here, that was the um, that the uh, new freeway is going to go in, the old freeway is coming out of here, and a connection from the new the down existing downtown core area to the shore area is the focus of this BIM storm, this area right in here. And, We'll be looking a little bit more at, of that at that later. Um, Tammy, feel free anytime you'd like to jump in, but I'm going to keep on rolling unless you have any uh, comments. But uh, so um, a couple more comments before we go live here. Uh, this is actually a very important concept for us in the BIM storm. Uh, a lot of architects and designers are very familiar with building information modeling. A GIS or geographic information systems has been around for a long time, but not as uh, commonly used until things like Google Earth came around and now we have maps on our smartphones that put a dot on a map and say here you are here and here's the nearest Starbucks for example. Um, so what we do in BIMSTORM we, we look at it from this perspective we look at it from a world world view where you have a dot on a map and you say here's Hong Kong you zoom into the city you see buildings uh, you click on a building you open the building up and you see the plan of a building, you go to a certain floor, you see the layout of that floor, you go to a room, you see the, the, the spaces in the room. And this can happen for an entire city model. Um, the difference between this and the very detailed building information models that a lot of us are used to for uh, design and construction, which are incredible and we use those tools as well, is that this is a lightweight version of the same data that can be streamed live through the internet. So you, as you're changing things, so if somebody was actually moving a building, for example, in a planning exercise, another person would be able to see that live. It also opens up opportunities to connect other types of information to it. So for example, you could say, how many total square meters of building are we looking at in the, this part of the city in Hong Kong? Three million square meters, for example. How, ma how many square meters is building number 23? 10,000 square meters. How much utilities? What are the utilities in this area? What's the latitude and the longitude at the corner of a building? How much energy is being used by the building? Where does John sit in the room? What's the carpet in the room? Etc. And then in the other, in another angle, you can also say, well, when I'm in the room, I'm John sitting in the room, and I know that I'm in Hong Kong, and I know I'm in this building in the city. So it's kind of a scaling thing that it doesn't matter what angle you're looking at it from. And this this is a critical piece for architecture and city planning and engineering. We produce a lot of information, a lot of data. That data is incredibly valuable if you can give it give access to other users that know nothing about BIM. So people that are on smartphones, for example, if they can have access to that information, um, it uh, makes it extremely valuable. Uh, in the other direction, you could say, well, I, I don't I don't care anything about the building. I'm a dot on a map, and I want to know everything about where that what's happening on that dot on the map. So all the information, including where John sits, can be a dot on a map that says he's in Hong Kong, and I don't care about the rest of the building. But I'll, it's all interconnected. As an architect, I was at a conference last week where um, architects and builders were in the room and an architect stood up and we were all talking about information, and building information modeling, and the, the tone was that, oh, well, I, I, as an architect, I didn't sign up for being a data manager. I didn't sign up to manage data. Well, that's absolutely wrong because as architects, that's all we've been doing for the, our whole existence is managing information in our head, which is data, which is converted into buildings. But now with this technology, it actually frees us up 
to actually get, get on and do the work. And that's what BIMSTORM really is all about. How do we harness the tools to make intelligent design decisions? You still have to have people interacting. And that's why BIMSTORM is about collaboration and connecting people to be able to make design decisions. All right, so that's the intro. I think Finance is going to go up next and show you a little bit of what's going on around the Oklahoma City area. And then I'll come back later and show you some basics about how we're going to run uh, the rest of the uh, BIM storm. This is an introductory webinar. I really highly encourage everybody that's online. You've received links uh, to animations. There's a lot of tutorials. I'm not. We're not going to use these sessions to do step-by-step -step training of everything. There's already a lot of tutorials online of how to start a project, how to put a building together, how to get data out. So I encourage all the students online and all the professionals that are jumping into the BIM storm to watch some of those tutorials. Um, you don't have to know everything about all these tools. You just have to jump in and collaborate and, and learn and even fail. You don't have to know everything about all this. But the, the key is to collaborate. If you don't connect and you don't collaborate in this world where it's a Facebook environment, and the revolutions that you saw that were, were, were spawned by Facebook or the use of Facebook and other tools, the reason they work is because people were, t were communicating to each other. And that's what we need to do in the building industry. We need to, to find ways to communicate better uh, through um, these uh, tools. So, Fineth, are you ready to jump in? I think so. I had to uh, switch uh, microphones here. My husband was having right. problems. Can you All hear right. me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so um, everybody, you should be seeing um, the uh, you should be seeing actually a Google Earth view. Of, Not yet. Uh, downtown Oklahoma City. Not yet. What's that? Uh, did we switch oh, screens? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, Amber, did you bad. switch? Show my screen. I still see white here. Um, I made him the presenter. Do you see show my I'm screen? Saying that I'm showing screen. Nothing. Nothing. I I see his screen. Oh, you do? Okay, so I do. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. All right, we'll keep going. If you if you does everybody else see it? Young, do you see it? We do things on the. Side of the screen. Okay, that's good. Keep okay. keep on rolling. Okay. No. <laughs> it just doesn't. Where are you today? Uh, Washington D.C. <laughs> oh, so it, it just doesn't work in Washington D.C. Yeah. Some of the security um, stuff. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, so um, the uh, what you're seeing in front of you is um, a Google Earth view of downtown Oklahoma City, and you're seeing a lot of little dots and, and things called buildings that we own here, which Kamon's uh, going to show you right after I right after we move away from here. These are buildings that were brought into this into Google Earth via the uh, GIS from Oklahoma City, and the um, and basically went into the Enuma system, were converted into building information models, and then uh, basically we were able to we were able to drop them, export them out into Google Earth. So what you're seeing here is it's just a small building. I don't even know what street it's on, but uh, it's a 1,168 square feet. Right now it's shown as one floor. We actually can predict that that building takes about 22,000. Uh, kilowatt hours per year of electricity, you know, all those kind of things that are coming from the model. So what 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 this is created from is is one of the things that we believe is a bit unique in the Enuma system is taking GIS uh, information about building footprints and rapidly uh, all these buildings you see on here were probably created in 30 seconds or so. So you know it's like a like a no, uh, almost a zero in the scheme of things, a zero time uh, frame creation of models. Now, when these came in, we made the decision that we were just going to show all the buildings in Oklahoma City, in this downtown area, as one story buildings, just because, you know, knowing that, you know, a lot, there's a lot of low structures, it's probably the default, it's a good default position. We had the op option at the time uh, to bring them in as uh, multi-story, so they could have been five-story buildings, three-story buildings. Um, there are things in here that need cleaning up, like I, I suspect that the building is like this building right here, this 29,078 square foot building, which is setting over the, I believe, over the new interstate, probably got demolished when they built the road. So there are some issues related to um, 
what we call you know clean data and, and data sets that are kept up to date where where there's probably a group of build, buildings in here that somebody will have to go into the system and delete them just because they're they're just not right and they're obviously not right there are other buildings that we're going to need to go and what this web command is going to show you next we're going to need people to start doing things like let's just for instance say this building this little 5308 square foot building really is a, I think we brought it in Kimon at 15 feet uh, just kind of 15 foot floor to ceiling kind of number right. floor to top mm -hmm. um, you know this building maybe in reality if you go to you were to and if you were to go into street view here let's see if I can do this without it totally uh, bombing here so if I were to go into street view in this area that building is right there now if we and zoom out just a little bit and look at it. Yeah, you know, we're showing a building that we're showing our building probably half as high as that building really is. So what we one of the things that we would like people to start doing over the next week is going into the system and Simone's going to show you how rather quickly we can take this from the building height that it is to match the building that's there. So in in reality, you know, you can zoom in and even count bricks or make good guesstimates. You know, if you say this is a five-foot window and you've got six feet below it, that's 11, and you've got another another five feet above it, it's 16, and say you put part of the roof in. So, so instead of 15 feet, it should have been 25 feet. Uh, those are the kind of approximations at this scale that, that we believe uh, work well enough. They they get you close enough to what uh, what the actual massing is on the site and what we're hoping is that people will grab onto this and uh, now that now we've got a starting point and go in and make those kind of changes it's also easy um, as just a for instance say one of these buildings was a multi-story building rather than um, in whether than rather than the one-story building it's quite easy in the system to delete you know, say let's just take this building this is a larger building 20 it's almost 29,000 square feet, but maybe this is in reality a three-story building when you go look at it in street view. Or somebody who, who you know, grew up in Oklahoma City knows it, and it's you know, it's their, it was their father's bank or something. Um, this building maybe was a three-story building. So it, in the system, what we wanted to do is we want to go in and either make it three store a three-story building, so give it a 45-foot height, or we want to say it's a three-story building with We'll drop it out, we'll delete it out, and we'll re-enter it from the GIS as a three-story building with 15-foot floor to floor. And those are the kinds of things we're doing. Now, there have there has been work done already by um, by Professor McEwen and her students. If you click on on these other areas, they've been identifying um, these specific planning areas and the work areas, making connections out to other web web resources. So in this case, uh, the blog that's talk, starting to talk about what's going on in um, going on in this area with links. So there are there are plenty of other things that need to be done to uh, prep us for uh, you know for a for three weeks or three or four weeks from now when we're actually getting into the the throes of uh, trying to come up with some solutions that really fit into this area. Um, but the, one of the goals, and I'm going to hand it back over to Kimon now, is to is to really make this make the files, make the models in the system very data rich, so that as people all over the world and in Oklahoma are working on this, we're working with with more data and more information and more background and better understanding of the area than you could in any other any other approach. So with that, come on. Is that enough to get you started? Sure. Let you, let Let's see if you can see my screen. I didn't see your screen, so I didn't see what you were showing, but I could kind of imagine that you were showing all Google Earth uh, views, right? You haven't shown yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I did not go out of Google Earth, so okay. I didn't show the system there. All right. So let's, um, a couple things before we, we dive into the, the system. Uh, one is uh, we have a, a bimstorm.com website where a lot of the um, information about previous BIM storms is, is stored. So if you go bimstorm.com, um, you click on some of the links and you'll see a, a list of previous BIM storms along the left side. In fact, we have one coming up in Washington, D.C. 
presentation of show and we call it show and tell. Uh, we have one coming up actually in a couple of weeks at uh, in Orlando for Construction Owners Association of America. And they will actually, even in Orlando, we will be presenting some of the results of the Oklahoma City BIM storm as well. So whatever is done in Oklahoma City is going to be presented in Orlando to the construction owners of America. Um, if you go to Oklahoma City down here, you'll see, and LAA, for example, LAX was one of the first ones. You see that one as well, too. We've added a few new things to the Oklahoma City uh, BIM storm site. We've added links to the uh, upcoming webinars. This was just added today. So you see the four webinars that are scheduled. Um, we have the uh, presentation by the planning director of Oklahoma City, Russell Klaus, that happened a few weeks ago. It's a YouTube a video that you can just hit and play and gives a really good overview of the, the reasons of how it's set up uh, here. Um, there are also links to the blogs and the uh, College of Architecture, University of Oklahoma blogs and website here, which is going to be updated as well, and some other information. Uh, for those that have not signed up yet, at the very bottom, you can sign up to get access to the tools. So once you sign up, it takes a day or two, but you'll receive information of how to get free access to these tools. And that's the one thing that we do in BIMSTORMS. We provide free access to the tools that we have. We've had in the past other sponsors come in and give free access to other BIM and GIS applications. Um, and that's kind of been a pattern of how do we share our information and, and get other um, participants in here. All right, so that's the uh, Oklahoma. Hey, Simone, one, yeah. Yeah. Simone, one interjection here. Um, architectural Record had a really nice uh, and very, uh, very clean uh, description of what has been happening in Oklahoma City in their magazine this month. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the things, also just, just Google um, Oklahoma City and um, architecture architecture record, and uh, there's a really you know, short and sweet kind of description of some of the really uh, exciting things and big changes that have been happening in Oklahoma City. Right, that's great. Yeah, there's there's so much information. That's actually one of the things that's been a theme in these BIM storms. It's that as a planner, as an architect, the complexities of these projects are just immense. If you can imagine, a, uh, even a single building has millions of data points. But if you start looking at a city plan and you start looking at utilities and you start looking at energy and you start looking at transportation or you start trying to find articles or, or plans that were completed, uh, access to that information is critical and the internet and the technologies that we have today we almost take it for granted when we walk around with a smartphone and we can get to any street map in the world well that was not always the case it was always very difficult to get that information so what we want to do is we want to have that level of access to our planning and architectural and engineering data because for the most part today that's not happening it's all kind of still in this uh, stone tablet kind of a concept that you put together a report in a PDF document or you put it in a binder and you put it on a shelf. It's very much kind of stuck in the 18th or 19th century. So BIM storms are about advancing that access to information. Once information is accessible, then you can start sharing it with anybody in the world, whether you're in the same room or whether you're across another side of the world. And that's what this is really all about. Okay, so once you log in and, and sign up for uh, the BIM storm, you, there's a few bits of information we need of who you are and what you can do. and then you send that off, you will get a login to the uh, Onuma system for a couple months for free. Uh, there's a us username and password. You log in with that. And um, actually, let's go ahead and log in here just to show you the process. I'm logging in with my name. Each user has a different level of access. So I'm seeing actually other projects that I'm working on as well. Uh, those that come in that are new users will only see the Oklahoma City BIM storm. You see a bunch of other BIM storms here. So if you participated in previous BIM storms, you still have access to information from four years ago. You can jump back to the LA BIM storm and see all the planning data and GIS data that we collected there. So it's just massive amounts of data that has been processed for these two and two, one, two, three, and four day BIM storms. So you go into what's called a studio. We have a studio called BIM storm Oklahoma City. In that studio are a list of projects. If you unfold them, there's just a few here. If you go to the previous BIM storm, you see that there's going to be hundreds of them. Um, Kelsey from the um, um, University of Oklahoma has started a, uh, a, a planning file under the project called OKC River District. Um, one very important thing uh, as you're working on these BIM storms, 
I mean, these projects is to share your data. So we have these little share icons here. These yellow icons mean that I want to share it with everybody else that's logging in here. So Kelsey has shared her file. That's why we can actually see it or duplicate it. And that's exactly what I did. I went into Kelsey's file and I could either edit it, but I went ahead and hit the duplicate button here and created my own version called training one, which I'll be, we'll be looking at today together. So that's one view of it, or you could uh, also look at a map view of, a, of the world and have dots on a map to show where they are. There's a lot of other kind of reporting and other capabilities up here. I'm not going to go through all the features. I really recommend looking at some of the uh, animations that are online that explain some of that. But basically, it's kind of a list of projects. Uh, each of these projects has multiple schemes. So for example, I could say training day one, training day two, and have a different version of it. If I go into training day one scheme, it looks like this when you first open it. It's a site plan. Let's start from the very beginning here, just from scratch here. But this is um, what's called a mashup on the internet. It's pretty common where you have access to multiple layers of information from multiple sources. This has not always been the case with planning and master planning or, or design. Um, as we know, it, you know, you typically have to go out and find the latest document bring it in and trace it or scale it or import it or whatever. Here we're looking at real-time data. So for example, the map in the background we're looking at is coming from Google Google Maps. They have an, an API that allows us to pull Google Maps into another application. In this case, we're looking at the Onuma system. Uh, let's close some things here so we have a little bit more space. And this map is live. So if Google were to update this map, we would actually see a new view of it. And Google does this once in a while. They, they do it every few years in certain areas. So it's not always live data, but it's live to the point that they have the latest satellite view. And um, another view of this would be to look at it from a street Google Street Map view. So this is the same map. We're all very familiar with this. This is how we find the nearest Starbucks. What's different here is that we also have another server. This is where the mashup part comes in. The first part of the mashup is this map from Google is mashed up into this Onuma building information modeling interface. But next we want to pull in data from, let's say, um, let's look at the buildings. These black buildings here are coming from another server, a GIS server, and the GIS data came from the uh, Oklahoma City GIS department. Uh, that shows footprints of buildings. So let's actually turn off the Google map for a second just so you can see what's going on here. These are actual footprints of buildings from various, um, we're not even sure what the source is and if, it really doesn't matter to me right now because we just want to see the density of the city, have a have a, um, a figure ground or a, you know different type of graphics using this. Um, and then I can also say well I really want to see the uh, um, uh, where the railroad is. So there's a railroad line. So these are layers on the right side. There's minimal layers in this case. We kept it very simple. Uh, the river area right there, parks, um, uh, vegetation, um, pavement, um, polylines and parcels. So all the parcel data is there. And the most significant thing here is that all of these are not just pretty colored shapes, they actually have data associated with them. So we could bring in the building footprint and turn it into a BIM coming from a GIS, even though it's coming from another server. In addition to this GIS data, um, the uh, University of Oklahoma uh, started to bring in different planning scenarios. So for example, a zoning study along the waterfront area here along the river was identified with different land uses and notes were starting to be to be added. This is a, a, another mashup coming from another server now. So we have Google Maps plus the GIS data plus BIM data coming in here and we can also turn on our the buildings coming from uh, the studies that's, that have started to happen down here by the waterfront area. So I can turn that on and off. Any of these can be saved as a graphic. Obviously I can print out a PDF but as you can imagine, there's infinite variations of graphics that can come out of this. And graphics from an architect's point of view and a planner's point of view, graphics are always important because they, they tell the story. But if you think of the internet and the way that graphics are generated on the internet, like Google Maps and find the nearest Starbucks, it's, it's created on what's, what's called created on the fly. In other words, it's going and getting the latest data and putting a dot on a map and saying, here's a restaurant and it's four star and you can reserve a table because the table is available at 7 p.m. All of that is becoming very natural in 2012 and beyond and even before this as far as the technology goes. If we apply that now to buildings, okay, what can we do if we have that type of 
access to information for buildings and cities, and that's what BIM storms are doing. Okay, so um, in addition to being able to, and I've copied Kelsey's scheme, so I'm not going to be messing up any of the plans that were already created, uh, but as a user, I could say, well, I, I like this building that was placed here, but I really want to change the shape of it because I really believe that it should really be doing this. Maybe it's a bad idea, I don't know. But as you change these shapes around here, uh, the basic uh, um, tools, it's intentionally kept very simple. This is not intended to compete with Rhino or CAD or, or BIM, but it is BIM with simple tools, which means that it's much easier to train a lot more people to touch the data. So you don't have to be a BIM guru or a rocket scientist to start using, or a GIS expert, or a mapping expert, or a uh, you know, any you know an engineer of certain type. You, you're you're bringing different experts' capabilities into and making that accessible to us, so we can start doing planning exercises like this and move these these spaces around. As we move these buildings, they actually update the the square footage and even cost data. So if I wanted to, for example, pull up a report. This might take a few minutes because there's a lot of buildings here, but let's pull up a site report and let, let that run in the background. As it's calculating all the square footage, actually that was pretty quick, it just calculated the square footage of all the buildings in the area, um, 4 million square feet of gross area, a million square feet of roof, uh, total cost of all these buildings, including that edit that I just did. And that's what excites me as an architect. When I, I, I love architecture, I love planning, I love to be able to spend more time in design. What I don't like to do is crunch numbers to say, well, how many square feet was this design? That should be done by a machine to give me more time to do design. That's what this connection here is. So if I change this out to here and refresh the screen here, it'll actually update all the data and the, the roll-ups about, about this new plan that we just did and create a pie chart that says, well, here is the uh, uh, the facility types by, and I, I didn't even know this was in here, Kelsey actually probably added this recently, but it's breaking up the buildings by use. So there's color codes that say there's a pink is mixed use facilities and green is this. So if I turn on this color coding here and say show me facility type by Omni class, I'm assuming, yep, there's the color coding. I didn't even know that was there. I just discovered it by turning this on as I was doing the presentation. Um, so I've edited these buildings now and all the reports. So from a graphical point of view, it looks pretty simplistic, but actually there's a lot of stuff happening in the background. It knows how many floors it is. So if I jump into the building and say, let's, let's look inside this building now. It's a mixed-use facility. How many floors are in that facility? And as we're doing this, if we were to export this building from here into Revit, we're essentially creating a BIM, a Revit model of this building that can be handed to teams to say, OK, here's my design. Start working with it. It's a fl simple floor plate here, but you can continue to add other spaces, for example, if I say I want to add uh, some circulation elements, um, uh, an elevator core, let's add an elevator core to it. There's an the elevator core there. Let's add some uh, bathrooms to the building. We need one of these bathrooms right here. Um, so you're starting to create planning elements if you want to keep on drilling into the details of the building. You're inside the floor now and you're adding information about a single room inside the building inside the city so we still are related back to the whole city but we're looking at an individual room there if you want to go to that level which means you can rapidly start planning okay what does a mixed use development look like what's on the first floor is commercial upper floors is residential what if we mix, we change the mixture of the residential units upstairs is it going to be two bedrooms and one bedrooms are we going to you know all that kind of stuff can happen very rapidly and you can you don't have to start from scratch like i just did here you can actually start pulling in templates which is kind of a bad word in architecture but it's not because it gives us the ability to pull in previously designed elements so we don't have to re reinvent well what's the size of a two bedroom unit and what are the elements inside it and all that stuff so a lot of different capabilities like this and as i'm doing this fineth on the other end can be seeing what I'm doing and be able to react to it and say, well, that's a really bad idea to make that building this massive. We don't want to break up the courtyard here or whatever the, uh, the issues might be. Um, all the time while I'm doing this, it's also creating that 3D Google Earth view that, that Fineth was showing earlier. So I could pull up a quick view of it here. Let's see if it renders. I have a lot of stuff running here, so I'm not sure if this 3D is going to pop up here in time. Oh, yeah, there it goes. OK, let's see what happens here. There's, there's that building. Um, you can see the floors. You can, well, yeah. Just, just interject. 
it's hard for finance to send you a note about the problems with this scheme if you don't share it. You're absolutely right. So I have not shared it. This is ab absolutely critical in your work in the BIM storm. If you don't share what you're doing, nobody else is going to be able to react to it. You're not going to get uh, a response. And if you're in a student in the class and you want your instructors to be able to react to your design, it's almost like turning your assignment in. So the fact that I have not shared it, Fineth can't see it. So up on the upper I right. Can, oh, I can see it. I can see it. I just can't react to you it. You can't react to it. You can see what I'm showing on the screen. But I haven't shared it, so you can't actually do anything with it. But now I'm going to share it with not only you, but I'm going to share it with the world here, with everybody that's logged into. Um, I'm going to share it with read-only permission with all the users in the studio. And if I click over the names of the users, I actually see their names there. There you are, Fineth. So you're going to get access to it. And I'm going to give actually give you access even to, to edit it to, to all the users of the studio. Now that I saved it, I don't have to download the file to my desktop, attach it to an email as a 200 megabyte file or whatever it is and send it off. It's basically on a server in the cloud. This is called cloud computing. Uh, it's saving it to a server, which means you can then download it into other applications and keep on working with it. Um, this is happening immediately as I'm making this change in, in Washington, D.C. and Fineth is, where's Fineth today? In Salisbury, right? I'm in, I'm in Salisbury, yeah. yeah. And um, Young, who's usually in Pasadena, happens to be in Washington, D.C. here. But he's not even in the same room with me. He's in his own room watching online like this. This absolutely changes how you live as an architect and a planner. You can be anywhere in the world and collaborate. And it's, it's not to say that we don't like face-to-face -face time. That's still very important. But it becomes much more valuable if we can resolve the major issues and have instant access to this information as we're doing the design work. Okay, so I made a really ugly building here. If I spend a little bit more time, I could make it, you know, more interesting or whatever. But um, I could do things now like um, we're just looking at one building still. But I could, well, actually, yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's export this out. Let's do an export and say, export this out. I, you've already seen Google Earth. There's a lot of other options for exporting. So going to the cloud, to the server and saying, I like what I see on screen, but I really want it as a Revit model because I want to start as a Revit model of the, here's a requirement. A client said they want a four-story building with a, uh, a one bathroom on each floor and the elevator core. That's all I want. The designer has to complete the design, obviously. Or I can go to SketchUp and say, export it as a SketchUp model. And I'm downloading it. There it goes to my desktop. I go to my desktop application and and I start running SketchUp. I'm, now I'm on the desktop. I'm no longer connected to the cloud. I have a brand new SketchUp model. And there's a free plugin that imports these BIM XML files, very lightweight, simple files that can be imported. I'm going to go ahead and import. There's the just saved a minute ago. Import that. And it's going to move it to Oklahoma City. See, it says we're going to move it to another location on Earth because SketchUp is location aware. There's the Oklahoma City map with the zones that were created by Kelsey. And there's the building with these slabs that I had just created. And these slabs actually, they have kind of a, a, a uh, building information modeling structure to it. So they have floors, and the floors have spaces in them. And on the first floor, there's these, uh, there's a slab there. and there's the rooms that we actually created earlier. OK, so let's leave that behind and then go to another thing. So I'm, again, the, the best thing to do here is just get hands on, just try things out. Don't worry about breaking things because you can just duplicate it and try different versions of it. We call this creating the train wrecks. That's what we've been kind of referring to things in the BIM storm. We love train wrecks in a BIM storm. We love to make huge mistakes because we don't like mistakes to be constructed and put into the city and put into a building. You want to run through a lot of scenarios and find the optimal way to design a building or design a city and to interact with others that are, are working on it. In, the, in many BIM storms, as one team was working on a project here, the team that was adjacent to them, they would start interacting with each other and negotiating, well, how do we shape the space? That would never happen if you're off in a corner doing a, a beautiful design, no matter how beautiful it is. If it doesn't relate to your surroundings, it doesn't relate to the environment, it doesn't relate to energy, it's meaningless. And that's really what's great about architecture and the way that we work. We can collaborate and work with work in ways that, um, that make this happen. But more importantly, if we use these tools, now we can actually collaborate in ways that were not possible even a few years ago. OK, so let's go back up to the site level. So at the very top, you see these navigation buttons. It's It goes from, uh, it's kind of dimmed right now because we're no longer on the floor plan. We're at the site plan. So the site plan is, is darkened here. And you see floor plan. You see space plan. 
The basic navigation on the left side is a tree. These are all the buildings on the site. Let's turn off a few things here so you can see which buildings I'm really talking about. I'm going to turn off all the GIS layers, all the sketch layers. And these are the buildings that we're talking about. There's my ugly building right there. And, the build, and in these on the left, you can actually start drilling into the floors and seeing if there are any spaces on each floor. You're not required to put spaces inside the building. So if you're doing massing studies, obviously, you don't really want to sit there and create elevator cores and everything. But if you're studying an individual building, well, then yes, it's relevant. But you can mix and match that, actually. OK, so the next thing I'd like to show is how we work with GIS data. Um, I'm going to turn the GIS data back on here and let the, um, the buildings stream in here. There's the existing buildings that came from the Oklahoma City uh, uh, GIS department. Um, let's actually pick one here. Does anybody know? Well, I guess I can't, I can't have a dialogue because I can't hear you guys. But this building here, I'm, I'm not familiar with Oklahoma City, but it looks like it's close to downtown, so it's probably a taller building. But what happens here is on the right side, what I'm going to do now, I'm looking at another server that says, here's GIS footprints of buildings. It's not just a pretty graphic. It actually has the geometry associated with it. So I'm, I'm going to say, well, I want to grab the sketch tool. You see on the lower right here below the, the map area, there's a button called sketch. You get this pencil tool. And as you click, click around this building, I'm just clicking around it and double click. And I've selected one building. It says, OK, you've selected one building from the GIS layer. What do you want to do with that? I want to take that building, I hit the next button, and say, what do you want to turn that into? Do you want to turn it into a polygon, a building, a roadway, a construction pad, or a parcel? I'm going to turn it into a building. I click building. It actually is pulling the data from one server, merging it into this other server, placing it into the Onuma system, creating a building information model with the slabs or the shape of that building that I can continue to do things like Create a do a renovation on it, or create a simple massing model, which is the exercise we'd like to give to the class there uh, at um, Lee and Tammy's class, is to take these GIS shapes and actually create a massing model. It's almost like what we used to do with styrofoam models of just extruding the height so we can kind of get a sense of what the massing looks like. In Google Earth, there's some some of these buildings are already in Google Earth. The difference here is that if we create a massing in the BIM, we can actually start doing things like calculating square footage or even editing that mass. They come in, uh, so if I turn off the, um, the GIS now, all of a sudden we have a building here. It has a number on it. Let's turn open up the uh, that here, and let's turn on the uh, construction status. It says it's a new building. Actually, it's not. It, it defaults at a new building, but I'm going to double click. If you select any shape, this goes for the whole interface. If I select any shape, you see a little lock button there, which means I can't edit it. But if I double click on the shape, there's an option to unlock. So I'm going to call this building, let's just call it a bank building from GIS. So the task really is to start kind of assigning things to it. You can do start and construction date or demolition date. If that area of the city is scheduled for demolition or there's a new building coming in, you put in these dates. And in Google Earth, as you move the timeline, a 4D, you can actually see the buildings appear and disappear in the timeline. Um, if I unlock this again, there's a whole bunch of other settings. So I could say, well, this is not really a new building. This is an existing building. And what type of this is what uh, Kelsey did, I believe. She went and classified by OmniClass and said, this is a what is this? A commercial facility. And that starts classifying that building, which starts ending up in the reports, which shows up in the pie chart that we showed earlier, which shows up in a lot of other things as you start doing, well, how many square feet of mixed use development are we planning in this part of the city, in the quarter shore area? How many square feet of housing do we have? How many square feet of mixed use development or commercial area? It starts creating all those calculations that we hate to do manually, but we have to do when we have to validate what is our design really doing to this part of the city? And we've seen it over and over again. You've seen these kind of reports that have 50 page PDFs with a picture of the building with a little calculation at the bottom that somebody did manually. And then as soon as the design changes, that whole report is no longer valid. Um, we want to get, get away from that and think of this in terms of we're in 2012 now. We don't save any kind of static information that's constantly changing. So. The example that I always give is we don't go to the internet to make an airline reservation and look for flights and 
print out a PDF of all the flights that are available today and then come back two weeks later expecting to buy a seat on a plane. It just doesn't happen. The same thing has to happen in the building industry because the way we're doing it today is pretty much stuck again in the 18th, 19th century like we said earlier. Okay, so uh, this building, um, by default, it came in at one story high. Um, and there's a couple things we can do here. We can actually say, okay, let's go into the settings. There's another settings button down here. I'm pointing to this building, so it's only about this building right now. And I go into the settings tab, and a settings dialog box pops, pops up with a lot of other settings. You can start saying, well, what lead rating does this building have? We want to call, you know, call out the lead rating. What's the unit format? scheduling if you want to get into more detailed cost estimating and, and specification of what goes into the building. Uh, but what I want to focus on is a button called floors. So this building, um, oops, let's see, where is it? Darn, I, don't, I didn't select it right. But anyway, it's, it, this kind of shows all of the buildings in the, um, um, I think I could probably find it by choosing bank. Nope. Let's just say it's this test building here. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep on moving because we are short on time. But essentially, it comes in as a one-story building like this. Um, if we're creating a massing model, we can actually say the floor-to-floor -floor height is actually 150. And that just creates an extrusion that's 150 feet high. So we don't have to create floors for each level. It just creates an extrusion. If I was doing a new design, I wouldn't do it like that. I would actually go in and... Um, select the building and actually add floors to it. On the left side, you can actually um, open one of these up here and you'll see um, information about how, how to add add floors when you open up this building. So let's go into this building. Fineth, would you like to add anything or like take a breath here? I think I've been talking too long here. Probably people are getting tired of hearing me ramble on well, here. I, know. I think you did a good job. <laughs> the, um... But I think it would be good to good to show them adding floors so that uh, right. they can make they can make that call. You showed them how to go in and uh, extrude it, adjust yeah. if they want to just do an extrusion. But, right, the extrusion. Uh, adding floors. Yeah, adding floors is good for a new design if you want to get into knowing exactly what each floor looks like because you can actually step the floors. They don't all have to be the same shape. By default, they come all as the same shape. But as you add floors, you can say, okay, first and second floor are commercial, and up above that is the, the podium, and the housing is above that, so you can step it in. The extrusion works well. The 150-foot extrusion that I showed earlier is good for rapid massing models, and we would actually recommend that for the, the urban planning scale stuff that's going on here because we don't want – you do get into a, a limitation of geometries when you try and render it in 3D. So just like any 3D program, if you try to take this out to Google Earth and there's a 1,000 buildings with – 50 floors each it'll move slower in google earth because you have to churn through the processing of the floors in the onuma system it's not really when we're looking at this it's not really generating it's not using a lot of memory to do that so it's, it's not a problem but as you start generating taking it out even into Revit, for example or sketchup and you have a thousand buildings with 50 floors each it starts to you know you start slowing down so the the second method of how do you make the building Look, come on before you do that show them this building in 3d Okay, yeah, let's take it in 3D. And my Google Earth plugin for some reason is choking on me here because it's not bringing in the satellite view, so I think it's just uh let's see what happens here. Yeah, so there's there's a basic massing of that one story building. You see kind of the edge here. If I click on the building, it actually has it actually has data associated with it. Imagine that. We're architects, we 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 didn't sign up to deal with data. Yes, we did. Everything we touch is about data. <laughs> it's data about how many square foot this building is, how many kilowatt hours of energy it's using, just on a rules of thumb. I created that shape. I said it's one floor. It's going and grabbing data from Department of Energy uh, uh, standards of how much a typical office building uses, and it's giving me how many kilowatt hours I'm using per year on this building. I can go in and change the assumption, and it could, it could adjust for Oklahoma City, for example, or I could say, I want to reduce reduce the energy use by 20% because we have these goals. It's all about data. If we don't have data, we can't do good design. Period. This is all about data. Uh, now, now show them ten stories. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so then we go in here and we're in the building on the lower left. It says add floors. I can add floor one floor at a time. I'm going to do this one floor at a time. There's a way of automatically creating the whole city in, in, in an Excel file. We haven't shown that yet, but you can take an Excel file and say, I want to make this a 50-story building and just extrude it up 
to 50 stories, but I'm just adding one floor at a time. So you add, delete floor. Okay, maybe I'll only do three floors. I'll add one more just, just to make it fun. So add one more floor, and I'll go to the fourth floor, and I'll do one, one simple edit. I'll just move one of the walls in. I just went nuts when I heard heard somebody say this is not we didn't sign up for data I'm just gonna keep on going at that for the next year I think okay so here's that building uh, and I can I'm on the fourth floor of this building and I'm just gonna say okay on the fourth floor I just want to pull pull these lines in a little bit I'm gonna step it back because this is a housing tower okay so now I'm gonna go into 3d and look at this building now again in 3d Notice that it's created slabs. If I take this out to Google Earth again or, or SketchUp or Revit, it's going to create that volume. There's a four-story building. Pretty ugly, but we're designers. We can have a good time with this now and say, okay, we have this mass. This is our maximum mass we can build with. Uh, look at that. It recalculated the data of the square footage, recalculated the data of the kilowatt hours, and gave us a new report while we were just pushing shapes around. If we can't deal with data and we can't attach data to design, we're no longer architects in the 21st century and we're just toast. So this is a call to action to just jump in and learn this. Otherwise, we're just going to become less and less relevant. And for some reason, as an architect, I've seen this over the last, how long have we been working with BIM? Fine, it's almost 20 years now, right? Both of years, years. We thought this was going to take off 20 years ago. It's taken this long and for some reason, Architects have been the slowest to jump into this. Unfortunately, you know, the contractors and builders have been on it faster. Now is a chance to jump in and, and just learn this stuff and just get moving because there's really no more time to, to work with 18th century processes. Okay, get off, get off my soapbox. Hi, Kimon. Yes. Uh, Tammy has a comment that she would like to make before we sign off. Of course. That's great. Tammy, are you there? That it well, can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can. Loud and clear. Oh, great, great. Um, sorry, earlier I just was having a problem with my mic. Um, one thing before we sign off real quick, just to clear up on the um, neighborhoods that are laid out uh, currently, the, the color-coded uh, areas with the southeast side, the Hubcap Alley, this park area, the river neighborhoods, and the Wheeler Park area. All of those um, are, are programmed areas within our river district for this BIM storm program. So they are all slated for redevelopment and even the river's edge. Um, as you can see with the current GIS data set, uh, it, it, it's not real densely populated and you know the buildings existing are, um, it, it, it's a lot of uh, Different mixed use for Hubcap Alley is um, is very much a um, uh, industrial area, but it has a lot of historical reference to it. Um, what I would just like to point out to uh, everyone participating in this um, that a lot of these areas will be completely completely um, redeveloped. So the green area, the southeast site, that currently is a junkyard. So it is um, at this point <laughs> um, an auto salvage yard is what I should call it um, that will be uh, totally um, redeveloped. Hubcap Alley does have some current um, buildings existing, a lot of historical reference and some reuse uh, potential there. Um, and then also the Promenade Park, that area is dedicated to, to all green space. So it is, as it's blocked out here as a park area from I-40 bounding on the north, I-40 bounding on the north uh, edge down to the river's edge, all of that will be uh, dedicated green space that we need to leave um, unless, of course, we have some uh, planners and architects that want to participate, um, take their teams into developing some beautiful um, outdoor spaces there. And then the river um, neighborhoods and Wheeler Park to the west has, you know, a different program as well. But 
I, I really just wanted to point out that from this I-40 has been relocated so this north boundary is the current boundary it's a completed um, uh, thoroughfare now and so from I-40 on the north edge down to the river's edge uh, this district is the river district and uh, all slated for uh, redevelopment. Great well thank you Tammy to you and to the University and to Lee and to your students for uh, being proactive and jumping in on this and um, we look forward to and one one thing we'd like to say is that the students there are the eyes on the ground we we have not we're we are not familiar with the city so even though i keep on talking about this virtual ability to work virtually it is important to have eyes on the ground and i think that understanding of the city and the ability to to design around that is going to be very important for this bim storm um, so we look forward to working with you guys on this right come on one one thing just to leave okay. everybody Thank with because that is one, one thing to leave everybody with so that they don't feel that they have to be working the Enuma system the whole time. I want to make sure everybody understands the Enuma system in this case can work as a, a way to quickly understand how, how your projects fit into this context, but then they can be taken out and, and developed in other tools, analyzed in, you know, in, in the uh, higher level analysis tools and that's what we're hoping that this starts to generate that you know projects developed here at this level uh, studied at this level but then moved out into Revit or ARCHICAD or you know Grasshopper or whatever and Absolutely. then developed at a higher level and analyzed using using other BIM tools the whole idea here is to you know really spread your wings and try everything not just get it, we're not pushing that everybody just stay in these, you know, blocky, chunky masses here. Exactly. That's that's exactly right. Uh, use there's in previous BIM storms we've used a whole range of tools. There are probably I don't know forty or fifty different tools that some of that we never even heard of before. People jumping in with um, we used Vasari and Revit and Archicad and and a lot of GIS applications and SketchUp and. Uh, a lot of energy analysis tools so we really want to see that come out and our belief is as this industry the building industry moves forward there are going to be more tools out there that are going to be easier to use it used to be that you used to use one or two different very powerful applications but imagine your your smartphones and the apps that are on your smartphone that's just we're just playing around with 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 technology as far as I'm concerned there because that's just starting off but apply that to the building industry imagine if you can take an smartphone or a tablet and walk around and, and be aware of your surroundings not only about the nearest coffee shop but about what's going on inside the building or what's going on in this part of the city so very exciting time to, to be in as, as a student especially as you guys are coming out of school the the uh, economy is really horrible right now but for those that can move into the future or the present as we're working right now it's really there's a lot of opportunities and we hope to be able to share share that and uh, help to move architecture and uh, planning and the building industry forward. So with that, I think we'll sign off unless there's any final thoughts from Tammy or Lee or the class there. Any questions online? Or uh, yes, Kimon, there's one question. Uh, somebody wants to know uh, how do you manage possible overlapping work within a BIM storm? Right, that's a good question. It's kind of a clash detection thing. Um, what We showed glimpses of it, but for example, the Google Earth file that Fineth had open. We use Google, we've used Google Earth a lot because it's uh, you can you know there's a free version there's a paid version but it's easy to get to in in Google Earth we could do exports so for example if I'm doing a scheme here and with my great idea of an ugly building and somebody else has a better idea for a prettier neighborhood we can actually export those both out to Google Earth and just toggle back and forth and say well here's Kimon's poorly planned idea or great idea or whatever and turn on the other one and then continue to move on that this is part of the train wreck process we talked about we want to see different layers coming on and off obviously when you're getting into a real world, world scenario you need to kind of hone it down to what is our final design you have to collaborate with others across the way so it's, it's not going to magically resolve itself you still have to make design decisions and communicate with people and you communicate you know either face to face or through through the uh, the tools that we have online. So one, one way that we actually communicate a lot is we showed the sharing, but there's also something called BIM mail. So I could send out a mail. Um, let's see, I haven't shared this scheme yet. 
I thought I shared it. I might probably didn't I didn't save it. So if I share this and uh, I send a BIM mail out to everybody, okay, there we go. I could say here's here's um, I'm sharing it with everybody. So now now it's accessible to everybody, and I could say okay, I'm going to send a message. All of you that have signed up for this will receive a, an email from the system that says here's the the studies that I did in training number one. So all the users, I say here's uh, training. Number one, here is my study. What do you think? Now it's your turn. There you go. You'll get an email, and it'll point you back to the scheme. So I'm not sending you the file. I'm just pointing you back to the location on the internet where this is stored. And if you have the right access level, you'll have access to it. And I've I've shared it in a format that you can actually edit it, so you're free to edit it because this is a, just a duplicate that I was uh, testing around for this training session today. Okay. Right, and in the in the next training, few training sessions, the type of thing we're going to be talking about is how do you, you know, how do you create? Once you've created a scheme, how do you get input? You know, you're an architect, you've created a scheme. How do I get input from a mechanical engineer or a structural engineer? Right. Uh, I'm a I'm a structural engineer, and I want to to give somebody feedback. How do I do that? Right. Those kind of things, and that's that's really what the Training that we're going to do from this point forward is all about how do you how do you interconnect with other professionals and other people, even down to the people who live in Oklahoma City. How do you how does somebody who lives in Oak, in down in downtown Oklahoma City who sees something that he or she loves or hates how does how do they communicate that back to the designer? Exactly. All right, I think we'll sign off. But I want to thank again Fineth for helping me today and. Lee and Tammy in Oklahoma City, your students, uh, Amber who from my team in Los Angeles who helped host this to make sure I didn't crash while I had a poor internet connection here at the hotel, and Susan and my team in Pasadena who also were on standby in case things went bad. We, we have this kind of a backup approach to working collaboratively like this and uh, you saw it in action. So thanks for joining us. Uh, hope to see you in the next session and try and encourage more people to jump in. The more the merrier. Thank you. Thanks, Kamal. Take care.